Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Olivier Bojar from Semtech, uh, representing ESA Lower Alliance. Uh, and you're going to have a panel uh, of speakers who are Alliance members on the topic of uh, explaining how our technology, called LoRaWAN, is enabling different uh, use cases and in industry to be more efficient and productive, as it says. But maybe a few words about Laura Alliance. So Laura Alliance is an open organization, non-profit that was created uh, now almost six years ago, started by 15 companies. Now we are 400. All logos are here. And uh, Alliance does uh, three things. First, it's a standardization body. We define software protocol called LoRaWAN, so chip to cloud protocol, standardization. Second, we also define the certification program to certify all device according to the LoRaWAN protocol. And third, we do marketing. So all members put money in common to do these three things. Uh, and majority of the budget, of course, is to promote to the promotion of LoRaWAN. So you can see the number here. And what is important, it's an open standard. So all the software we are defining, you can find it in open source. Absolutely free for everyone to use and reuse. And uh, we, are, we were not able to fit in this room of 400 members. So we selected the four best. They are here. And uh, I will introduce them one by one from uh, my left to further left. So first one uh, is Nicola. Uh, Jordan from Actility. So in few words, Actility is a supplier of LoRaWAN core network solution. And also through an acquisition of uh, another French company called ABWay, they have done a super low power tracker system that Nicolas will explain what they have done with this solution. So Actility. Second in the line is uh, Adrian McLennan from Assystem, who is an international company based in Toulouse. And their expertise is predictive maintenance. So they use the exact same LoRaWAN technology to do predictive maintenance solution. He will explain what they've done. Third is Lyubomir Yanchev from M Climate, who is also a European company. Uh, Lyubomir is a CEO and founder of this company. And what they are doing, basically, they do smart building. So whatever building people make, they make it smart, but in a way that you solve what is the resource management, the, uh, let's say, energy efficiency of the building while maintaining comfort for the user inside. That's the challenge that uh, Lubomir will explain. And last but not least on the list, Didier Elal from Orbiwise. is one of the co-founders of the company. So Orbiwise is also supplying uh, the solution for the LoRaWAN networks to any company. But also, they have expanded their reach to end-to-end uh, -end solution, uh, especially to manage uh, pollution that is everywhere in the city, the noise. So they manage noise pollution through the LoRaWAN. So you have, I think, here a good diversity of uh, different applications of LoRaWAN. Uh, and I will leave the floor to the first speaker, Nicola. So go ahead, Nicola. You have eight minutes. Well, please help me to... Thank you, everyone. So the, the two keywords, for, for, for even for those, of course, who are discovering LoRa, the two keywords about the use cases that we cover for LoRa is the fact that we can, it's a radio technology where we can cover an e extremely impressive long distance over 20, even over satellites now. There are some lot of projects, so 20 kilometers, even more, with a kind of simple gateways that may look like most of the time as a, a Wi-Fi router. But instead of only 50 meters, you can cover really extremely long distance and very low power. It means that you can have most of the, you see the use cases are based on non-powered sensors where you, you can have a need of uh, sensors and attractors who can have to live for years, uh, for months or even years, even up to 10 years, more even more, to be able to retrieve and manage information. So there are the use cases that we're going to de describe, the one is more we focus with the Abbey way has been mentioned by Olivier, is related to tracking. So there are uh, tracking demands, very large type of diversity of demands. So I will explain and share two ones. There is one, a French one. Uh, so for the company called RATP, it's a French subway. I think you, most of you are French, you know very well of RATP. 
And uh, they are, as you know, they are expanding their network and building new lines, uh, even more for the Olympics. And this, uh, the w there is a worker safety use case in this construction site, so it's on the ground. And uh, the idea is, first of all, on the network side, it's to be able to really having a very large coverage. So there is one, this famous gateway that is installed on every stations. And if you with a specific uh, oriented antenna, you can cover, of course, the stations plus the, the tunnel on the left and on the right of the sessions over up to kilometer and uh, inside the constraints of course being on the ground. So having one gateway every stations with this two kilometer range, you can cover the complete uh, network uh, inside the coverage. And today, because the, the network will remain when the, the, the new uh, corridors will uh, of course be become operational, when the new, new, the new extended network extension will, will be operational, they will today try to track. It's mandatory to know the number of trackers that they are getting inside the tunnel. So you have big panels with the number of trackers and to localize them. So to be able to localize them, because there is no GPS, of course, in, uh, on, the, on the subway, there are some small, very low cost, effective VLDB coins that are installed every 50 meters. So then you can localize the group of users where they are, count them, be able to know where they are, and transform this information in real time over this LoRaWAN network that's, uh, that's under the coverage. And uh, so we are deploying uh, uh, almost 4,000 uh, trackers, uh, smart badge, in fact, it's for a user. That's the, the form factor. There are other form factors regarding the needs if you want to track an asset or a person. So this is smart badge that the people can wear. So you have a button here. If there is an emergency issue and you, you fail, you can, you can, the accelerometer, you can even detect a shock. You can, at the front of the use case, then you can uh, be able to, uh, to send a warning and to be, to be secured, uh, saved. That's the first use case, if I still have the time, I think. Yeah, there is please. another completely different use case, more outdoor, that we have uh, won and deployed in the, in the Middle East, more precisely in Saudi Arabia. There is a new uh, tourism trends, and they are building from from the desert over uh, s several islands. You can go over the, the 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 website. It's called Red Sea Project. It's um, they are really building a new cities infrastructure for tourism with hotels, airports, uh, wind turbines to be able to, of course, to generate energy desalinations for the water. It's 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 they are spending uh, four billion per quarter for that project just to give you an idea of what's it's hap it's happening there. And right now they would like to save and to track the workers uh, over uh, 250 kilometer square uh, distance. And we have been able to install with a local partner of course uh, around 100 gateways to cover the complete area. That's to show you really the distance. Of course it's a uh, the desert, there is no in buildings. It's, when you do, of course, a deployment over a, a dense city concentrations, you need to increase the density of the number of gateways. This famous LoRa One router, but on the desert, it's, it's even easier. You can really, again, reach 20, 30 kilometers per, per point. And then be able to, with the same trackers, be able to, to track secure people, count them. For example, there are, because it's islands, there are boats, uh, and they count people getting into the boats. And then people get out of the boat to check if no one has been filled into the water or for security reasons. Still the same buttons in case of. So we track uh, people. We are talking about uh, almost 4,000 workers there. So it's quite uh, very quite large. But you see the, the, the idea and the dimension of the project is quite very impressive. And also asset. So we have a bigger tracker for that much more solid to be able to, uh, in the construction site, there are a lot of chocks. Then that to, to track um, trucks, uh, assets that people or tools. Uh, we have also specific uh, capability to track smaller tools around the toolbox. You have a toolbox, you want to make sure that nothing has been lost. <laughs> and uh, you want to say something? Uh, no? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and uh, so you have this uh, capability to track even small tools, big tools, workers, and uh, in this extremely uh, huge area. Um, we, this to be able to have a very extended battery life technology. Battery life technology, thanks to LoRa, we also increase this by the fact that instead of computing the GPS positioning inside the tracker, that's really drained batteries, because GPS is really draining a lot of energy. We just take the ephemeride and the basics information, send it to the cloud over the LoRa network, and compute the positioning 
inside the, the, the core network. So you, you extend the battery life of the sensors for months uh, by a factor of tens, more or less regarding standard GPS technology. Um, there are some specific charging stations to, to, to charge them every six months. That's the objectives uh, around the workers, and it's uh, one of the ex very impressive uh, type of project that we are uh, seeing in the Middle East right now. Um, I don't know if I made one my more time. minute. One, one more uh, to conclude. Uh, but two years, yeah, but to conclude, uh, so tracking is one of course the um, uh, important use case that we see over Laura. We will discover uh, other things. The other use cases that we are. Uh, uh, deploying a lot is every, everything is related to metering uh, business, where even in France, uh, over uh, the Veolia and uh, Ring and Orange, there are three millions of uh, smart meters that are under deployment. So yeah, that's the. But you will see other examples of the diversity of this uh, of this type of um, uh, what the, this technology can bring. Okay, thank you, Nicola. So welcome. Next speaker, so after the, the tracking application, Adrian will explain the predictive maintenance with LoRaWAN. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Um, Nicola, I think you gave you a very good uh, introduction as to why I think all of us are very interested in why we use the LoRaWAN technology. Um, this long-range capability and this low-power capability uh, is really important for the Internet of Things in particular and for our solution. Um, it is something which was and is extremely important for us and it's why we selected LoRa as the technology for us to be able to communicate uh, the information that we are gathering. What a system do is we, we work with a wide range of industrial companies and organizations um, and as well as we're more and more um, getting into smart cities as well, to be able to monitor the equipment, which up to now, when people have wanted to be able to monitor it digitally, haven't been able to do so because the equipment is very old. Um, typically, the type of equipment we're measuring, we're monitoring are pumps and compressors, conveyors, um, lots of rotating equipment, effectively, that is very important in the operation of the different companies with whom we work. Uh, here in France, we've got clients as diverse as Suez, Veolia, Total, Airbus, and more widely, we're working with other companies like Shell and Northumbrian Water. Various technologies um, that they and uh, requirements that they have in their production. And if any one of these, for any one of these customers, um, if one of the motors that they are using shuts down, um, it can cause a complete shutdown on their production, which for organizations like Renault, if they shut down for a, for a day because they had not expected a bit of equipment to, to shut down, it can cost them hundreds of thousands of euros. For an organization like Suez, if they shut down, yes, it has a cost, but it has also has an environmental cost if they end up having to pump uh, sewage into the, into the Seine, for example, or as we saw before we installed our, our solution down in Nice, they ended up putting uh, effluent into the Mediterranean Sea, which is not good. Um, so many of the environments where we're, where we're locating are hostile and often remote, particularly offshore. And so it's very important that we're able to communicate off over a long distance, but also that our solution is non-intrusive. What I mean by that is that effectively, uh, we can fit our sensors onto the bit of equipment that we're going to be monitoring and then forget about it. And we're able to forget about it because everything we're able to do after the beacon has taken the readings off that piece of equipment is done remotely. And we don't have to go back to the beacon because, again, one of the advantages of the LoRa technology that you heard just now is its low power consumption which means that this little device, once it's stuck onto a piece of equipment, is running on standard AA batteries, will last for over 10 years without you having to go back to it. There's no need to wire it in, no need to get, to get power, no need to wire it in to go and get the information back. So if you're putting in this in a, in a hostile environment, your engineers are safe and you don't have to go out there so often. Now, what we do differently to compared to a lot of other solutions is, is this, this particular beacon 
um, is an ATEX certified one, so it can be used in a dangerous environment. We do non-ATEX non versions as well. But it combines the use of standard vibration and temperature also with ultrasound. And what it means is that we are able to give the users a very advanced warning that something is going to go wrong with their piece of equipment. It might be that there is a lubrication problem. It might be that there is a wearing on a bearing or a gearbox issue. And we're able to detect that up to 10 weeks before they get any vibration. When you've got vibration, you've already got damage. And that's going to take longer to fix. It's going to be more costly to fix. And your shutdown in production is going to be that much longer, so having that higher cost. So this is something we're able to do by, by using the LoRa network. We process at the edge. We compress the data very down to a very small amount, which we're then able to then transfer across the LoRa network up into the cloud where we throw more AI at it. And then we're able to provide advice to the engineer who has to go and fix it exactly what the problem is. It'll be what we call incident advisor. We will recommend to them, you've got a, your ultrasound has gone up, and we think that you have a lubrication issue. The third piece, which is really important, is that whilst it is a predictive maintenance solution, which is end-to-end, -end, we recognize that in reality, most of these large organizations already have their own existing corporate infrastructure and software for monitoring all the other equipment. And so the architecture, the software architecture, is designed to be completely open so that it can be easily integrated into that existing corporate infrastructure that they've got so that the engineer is just looking at a single pane of glass. He'll just get a little alert comes up saying, you have a problem on your bit of equipment, and then he's able to go down to our incident advisor and see who that problem is. So to summarize, what we've got is this combination of triaxial vibration with temperature and, and ultrasound to give the earliest possible alert of a problem, the fact that they run on standard batteries for up to 10 years without having to go back to it, and the ability to go and transfer it very quickly over a very long range using the LoRa network. It means that the customers can prioritize their production and really give a focus on the final piece, which is obviously interesting coming from the UK at the moment where we've got COP26 going on. In terms of sustainability, it means particularly for the uh, energy industry where they used to have to fly engineers out to offshore rigs, you don't have to send a guy out on a helicopter or send expensive bits of equipment out there because the engineers on the rig are already able to just go and fix it. It helps with them to achieve their net zero. So with that, I'm going to pass over. OK. Thank you, Adrian. So now Lubomir uh, will tell you more about uh, smart building and energy efficiency. Your turn. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so our company is called M-Climate. So we started back in 2014. And our goal was to make any home smart. With the sustainability issues that we're seeing right now, and um, as discussed, um, are currently being um, talked about at the COP, uh, we actually turned, uh, uh, turned to uh, making buildings smart, because then uh, basically the footprint that you're able to save, it's way bigger than individual houses. The issue with smart buildings is really um, more about combining the sustainability, you know, the savings from energy, uh, with uh, the comfort of customers. Because uh, in most of the cases, actually, uh, tenants, be it residential projects or commercial projects, don't really want to give up their comfort at home just to be able to save some energy. And perhaps this is going to change in the future, but this is the trend that we're seeing right now. Um, so why do we do what we do? It's uh, definitely because of uh, the sustainability issues. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but... Um, Buildings in general in EU contribute to about, actually they, they consume about 40% of the energy uh, produced in the EU. And then they emit about 36% of the CO2, the global CO2 for the EU. Uh, and that's all about you know buildings that we see everywhere. And um, the thing is that buildings right now are not used very efficiently. Um, that's a lesson that we've learned throughout history um, but thanks to the innovation, finally we can actually have the same comfort or even better uh, at actually a lower uh, energy cost. And um, this is um, something that has been enabled actually by uh, the LoRaWAN technology. Because um, 
for a couple of years, we've been deploying uh, tens of thousands um, Wi-Fi devices, you know, directly selling to end consumers. And there, you have a lot of issues. Obviously, you're selling it only to one person, then you can upsell them with something else, etc. But then the footprint that you're um, actually managing to save, it's, uh, at the end of the day, not that big. Um, and when you think about it, I, I'm not sure how many buildings are there uh, in Paris, um, like exact number, but uh, if you just think about the, the CO2 that is being emitted um, thanks to those buildings, I'm sure that it's huge. Um, so the way that we go around things is uh, we address both commercial and residential customers. So we have a lot of uh, commercial uh, projects like um, office buildings, lots of them, high schools, um, also police stations, hospitals, etc. Um, so far, we also have a lot of residential buildings um, made smart in a couple of countries, like, uh, for example, uh, the countries in the Scandinavia, um, Germany, uh, the UK, and some others. So on average, uh, we managed to save about 30, 30 to 35% of the energy from the heating there. I'm going to talk about one of our devices right here um, just in a second. Um, the, how, we, how we work in those countries is we usually find a partner or the partner actually finds us in, in some cases. Be it uh, a, a utility, uh, a telecom that is actually concerned about the sustainability uh, and what is going on inside um, in, in their city. So uh, the most number, the greatest number of devices that we have deployed so far is actually this device. Uh, this is um, called Viki and it is a radiator thermostat. So it is applicable to every radiator. Every building that uses radiators can, you know, you can just swap it for, you know, less than a minute, your old thermostat with this one. And this one is connected. Uh, thanks to LoRaWAN, we actually managed to secure such partnerships with utilities because utilities, they actually just want to install the device and forget about it. They don't want to go and change batteries. They don't want to have connectivity issues. And this is something that uh, is basically promised by a lot of one, and not only promised, but also proved. So in reality, uh, people can adjust the temperature from the device. Um, all this data is fed to, uh, to a server somewhere. Um, and they can also control it from a mobile application. The nice thing is that they can also adjust schedules. So in, uh, in one of the Scandinavian countries, actually they agree on a building level, what is going to be the minimum and maximum set point. So, for example, they agree that the maximum temperature that they are going to set their home is, let's say, 26 degrees, because perhaps they don't need it any colder than that. Uh, they agree that they're going to have, um, you know, lower temperature during night, which is very healthy. Uh, and thanks to that, actually, in, in, in Scandinavia, in this Scandinavian country, I'm sorry that I'm not mentioning, but I'm also uh, under uh, a lot of NDAs. Um, last year, they installed 60 buildings. Out of those 60 buildings, basically, they managed to save 1 million euro in the bills of their customers. Uh, until the end of this year, uh, perhaps in Q into Q1 next year, they're going to have installed 250 buildings in total. And out of those, they're going to save 4.5 million euro. Uh, and uh, the good news is that uh, they're actually not doing it, uh, you know, for the recurring revenue or the profit. Most of their motivation comes from um, at the actual CO2 savings. Um, and um, that's one of the use cases I wanted to say. It's about uh, residential customers. So they're actually building a brand new product, a brand new business under their corporate, corporate hat. Um, the other use case, which is really similar, and I'm going to link the, the, those two uh, at the end. Uh, it's, a, it's a German consultancy company. And uh, those guys, they're actually building ventures for corporates. So they've been hired by two corporates uh, that are, you know, big, slow structures in most of the cases, uh, really hard to innovate. Um, and they build this, uh, uh, this business for them where they, you know, go and install just this device. And this device, as I said, a minute or two, and then you're done. You don't have to care about, uh, you know, how many gateways you install there. You know, in most of the cases, in you know, a building one is, is actually enough. The ROI for this device and this solution, I would say, uh, is actually less than a year. So in less than a heating season, um, the, the tenants are going to get 
their money back just from the savings that they have generated. So um, in this case, um, they are in joint venture with two utility companies and hopefully, you know, what motivates me is that um, hopefully in the coming years, they're gonna have access to about 12 million apartments. Uh, and those 12 million apartments, uh, I cannot uh, give you an exact figure of how much CO2 they emit, but I can give you an exact figure that they're gonna save about 30%. And uh, last but not least, the link that I wanna make here is that um, those two businesses, those two companies have been trying to deploy such a solution for three years, uh, both of them. They've been trying to do it from the other, you know, from different parts of the world, struggling with the same problem. So they recognize the same opportunity, uh, but they've been struggling to deploy it uh, in real life. And why? It, it, it's been a matter of technology. So uh, first, um, it's definitely the battery life. This device works on batteries for 10 to 12 years. Uh, it's just regular batteries that you can purchase, you know, anywhere you want. Um, that's first, and second, it's uh, a matter of, of number of gateways. <coughs> so they've been trying with other technologies that I don't really want to name, uh, but all the common technologies that we know for uh, wireless right now. Uh, but they had to install gateways every, uh, in one of the cases, they had to install a gateway every 20 meters. You can imagine what kind of investment this is. And this all boils down to, you know, what enabled them to, to go forward with, the, with those businesses and actually generate the savings, generate the uh, CO2 savings, uh, has been thanks to LoRaWAN. Because um, you install the device, you forget it for 10, 12 years, uh, and you have, uh, you, you, I would say, you don't, basically you don't have any connectivity issues. Because one gateway, um, depending on the size of the building, obviously, but uh, one gateway in most of the cases, it's, uh, it's enough. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. And now we will hear about environment noise detection with Didier. Thank Didier. you. I, I need this, uh, this device because when I see the, the cost of energy uh, uh, skyrocketing, I mean, I think that we all need really to, <laughs> to make uh, savings. Um, so, uh, OB-wise, we, we are initially uh, um, doing network servers. So, we come from uh, the microelectronics uh, uh, field before uh, we incorporated this company. So, we have developed this software for uh, the, the network, the LoRa One networks. We have networks all over the world uh, operating um, with quality of service. So, this, this domain, I mean, we, we understand perfectly the interest of LoRa One. But the most difficult is to convince our customers to find use cases. So what we did is that we, uh, we discussed with all the services in Geneva. We are based in Geneva. And uh, with the city of Geneva, we, we discussed with the green areas. We discussed with trash collection. And one of the services we discussed with is um, this uh, service of the pollution, of the canton of Geneva. And they are taking care about all pollutions, air quality, uh, noise, uh, and um, uh, radio, um, non ionizing uh, radiation, so radio frequency uh, uh, signals. And we identified uh, together with them uh, a pain point. How do they measure the noise in the city? The, the noise uh, um, is actually the second largest pollution after the air quality. It is impacting uh, lives. So this means that in Europe, there are 10,000 uh, premature deaths due to noise. More than 40,000 people are going to the hospital because of uh, consequences of noise on their health. I mean, stress, uh, heart uh, disease, and etc. And so they have to do that. They have to measure the noise. So in most of the country, and especially in Europe, you have this directive, compelling directive, that Oblige cities of more than 100,000 inhabitants to do uh, the noise measurement. And so this is done uh, with the uh, technology that was defining this directive 20 years ago. You are using a sonometer that is a certified instrument, super accurate instrument, and this sonometer is going to be placed somewhere. You measure during 15 minutes, then you get the statistics, you go to another place, you measure 15 minutes, and so on. So this is an, a huge effort uh, in terms of investment for the, the devices because they are super expensive. It's uh, 10,000 uh, Swiss francs, so uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, something like 9,000 euro. 
Uh, and then you have to have a, a whole team doing that during five years, because the directive tells you that every five years you have to provide this map, noise map for the city, and the corrective measures. So the cycle uh, of measurement is five years. What we have proposed to, um, uh, to the city is to use uh, IoT. So we uh, actually come from the mobile industry, uh, mobile phone industry, and so we have proposed to have the same phone that you the same microphone that you have in your phones. We have put them on this device, and this device is capable to make the measurements of the, the, the noise in the city. So what is super important is that uh, because of the LoRaWAN technology, you can put them wherever you want in the city. Because of the LoRaWAN technology, the wireless communication does not consume uh, uh, too much the battery, so you can really act for what you are here, uh, measuring the, the, the environment. And they have the freedom to put that for more than one year with only uh, one type D battery. So there are options to get longer uh, lifetime in the, in the field, but for them it's, it's a big, big difference because instead of having a five-year cycle to get the map of the noise in the city, they get a complete map in 15 minutes. And they have that every 15 minutes. So they become real time and continuous. So there are savings not only on the fact that they are not sending people in the field, you know, with a, a truck, with a, you know, the sonometer, doing all of that. They are also ha becoming, um, I would say, um, capable to manage the noise. Instead of just looking at what happens, taking measures and waiting for five years to get the results of these measures, they can reduce the correction uh, cycle. And so now they were, um, I mean, super happy about the results because they see the dynamics of the, for example, the road traffic in the city. They, they were not able to see that before. We have installed 600 of them in the district. So you see, you can have high density of these devices. That's not an issue. But at least, I mean, they were able to see the dynamics of the, 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 the road traffic. And this is super important because one part of this project is to follow uh, uh, the impact of the reorganization of the mobility in the center of Geneva. So there, uh, the whole, the whole uh, city center around the, the Gare Carnavant is going to be uh, reshuffled in order to push a bit the car outside of the center. And they don't know how to get the information apart from this solution uh, on how they are really impacting or they are really uh, minimizing the noise, uh, the noise pollution. So we have 200 of these sensors that now are deployed over this area that will, uh, they will measure the noise pollution before, while they are doing uh, uh, the, the, the changes, and after. And what is important is that if you modify, the, for example, the road traffic uh, in a street or in a few streets, then you can have an impact on another place in the city. You don't know how all of this is going to happen. And they have to react very quickly. And so they, they, with this system, they do real time. They would not even be able to do that uh, with the current uh, uh, measurement. So what, uh, today, what, I, I don't know how, how many time in, I'm still... Ha two minutes. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> so what is important is that this has been designed together with the customer. So LoRaWAN has um, this huge advantage of uh, a flexible deployment. And so that is absolutely incredible for, for the customers. You, you, just, you just put that wherever you want. You don't think about it. And second, it's important also that, um, you know, when the customer is uh, having a pain point, that we are working together with them on what is the important information that we are going to send. You were saying about edge. What we are doing is that we are doing statistics and sending only the statistics. So you don't need video to, to measure, uh, you don't need uh, the time service. You just need statistics. And then when we send this information, you have like a complete map. And it, again, with the edge uh, uh, inside the devices, it doesn't prevent to make some detections of events. So I mean, all our devices being spread uh, there, they can together generate an alert because you know what happens on all of these devices and then you can really manage uh, from uh, the, 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 the pollution services. So this is one of the, the, the many examples that we have seen and today, I mean, we see uh, <laughs> I mean, very nice examples uh, uh, of LoRaWAN uh, solution. We are not as developed as the other one, but we see a huge traction because this is a compelling directive and cities, they have to measure the, to, to measure the noise. So we have also done that on the, 
on the industrial side, we are working with refineries where they have to measure the noise, uh, and they are doing exactly the same um, in order to, uh, to um, limit their impact on uh, the citizens that are living around the, the refineries. So that was the, the example okay. that I wanted to... Uh, Thank you, Didier. So now you had an uh, overview of what we can do, or you can do with Laura One. Are there questions from the audience? Anyone? Yes, please uh, speak up, or do we have a mic? Or speak up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, good night. I'm a student. Uh, I wonder uh, if uh, the LoRaWAN technology will be influenced uh, now or by in the future uh, by interference either with uh, other communicative technology like uh, 5G or with the buildings and the materials they which, uh, who are using it. Okay. Uh, do we have yeah, I, I will tell you, I mean, I, I was in the technology before I was in OBY, so now it's a few years that I'm a sales guy, so maybe I forgot a, a, a bit of my, uh, uh, my science. But the reality is that the technology is not just a signal, it's a signal and a protocol. And so there is an important uh, aspect, is that the LoRa modulation is a very good modulation. It's very resistant to multipass. It's very resistant to mobility. It's very resistant also to the impact of the structure of the buildings. So this means that when you go through uh, a building, LoRaWAN has significant advantage versus other technologies, other modulations. But on top of that, there is a very strong, a very strong interest in the protocol, the LoRaWAN protocol. Because the LoRaWAN protocol is based on the idea that you don't attach one device to one gateway. So this means that when I have this device in the city, all the gateways that are there in the city will see this device. So he is broadcasting, and the network is taking care of capturing the data. So there will always be redundancy. And so when I say redundancy, it means that there will be spatial redundancy, so different directions where the gateways will get. And um, also versus an interference, it will mean that an interference on one signal will not be the same at any of these locations. So there is frequency diversity and spatial diversity. So this is super important. This makes the LoRaWAN technology ultra solid, I mean, ultra reliable. <coughs> it's in ISM bands. Anyone can emit there. But frankly speaking, we have SLA. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, so it, it's, I mean, we have SLAs on our networks. Just, I mean, this is clear. I mean, you know, network operators are asking us SLAs, and we guarantee these SLAs. Thank you. And we have some radio experts on the Laura Alliance booth. I mean, uh, David is capable to answer this. So uh, if you want to know more. Yeah. Another question? Another question, please. Yes. So we speak a lot about uh, private versus uh, public in other technology. Mm -hmm. So is it, I think, the same, is it the same for LoRa? So do we have some figures about how many connected uh, devices are public uh, connected and yeah. private connected? And yeah. maybe not for you, but for the LoRa Alliance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And is there any use cases or implementation where a customer is using a, a kind of hybrid uh, network, yes. so private for himself and then a public okay. when he go outside of uh, I can his location? can try to answer. So yeah, we did, uh, uh, actually, we, we did metrics, so I'm part of Semtech, and we, we sell majority of the LoRa chip everywhere. So you have uh, deployed worldwide, uh, we measure number of gateways, because a gateway is equivalent to an antenna in cellular, if you want uh, to compare. So we are above 1.5 million worldwide gateways. And I would say in terms of public-private, we have an estimate that, let's say, two-thirds of the volume worldwide are private network today. Uh, and then uh, what we also publish, Semtech, is the number of LoRa chipset we have sold since the beginning. So even if we are not the only one to provide chipset now, we are multi-source, but majority is still from Semtech. We are above 200 million worldwide since it exists, so cumulative. 
Uh, and this is growing, uh, of course, uh, very fast. But um, uh, what we measure also now with accuracy is how many are LoRaWAN. Because at the beginning, when you sell the chip, you don't know in advance which protocol will be in use. And LoRa Alliance is working hard to have accuracy of how many LoRaWAN protocol is put in on LoRa. But I don't know if that answers your question. Two thirds, private, and 1.5 million. To, to complete the second part of the questions regarding the bridge between public and private. So yes, this is now a reality. First of all, technically speaking, at the LoRa Alliance, there is some the feature set to the capability to be able to, what we call roam between networks, uh, is uh, technically available. And uh, as activity, we have uh, developed a roaming hub. But when I say roaming, it's not like roaming that like you used to have in mobile. Of course, you can move from a public service provider to another one. But in reality, the most of the use cases is moving from private to public for two reasons. The one is be able to have only one implement IPI implementations to one network and be able to be accessed to other networks. So you, you get your private access networks with your business around your factory, for example. And if you are looking for business continuity outside the range of the private gateway, then you can roam. Then, uh, and then to the to public network, be able to have, when we have the chance to have two networks, uh, like in, uh, for example in France, public networks, to also select the one automatically re regarding, be able to provide you this, this capability. So ease the, the IPI integrations by only one spot and be able to select public, private, which, which public ones, it's something that is a reality, large enterprise that ourselves will uh, serve uh, Air Liquide, uh, Schneider Electric, to exactly the, to, to serve this use case from moving uh, private to public if necessary regarding the, the use cases and the, where it's deployed. So it's a reality today, yeah. Other question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you pass the mic? Hello. Um, um, Laura is known for being uh, able to um, manage a big amount of, uh, of uh, devices with a small uh, size of message. What is the limitation in terms of uh, the size of the message, the bandwidth of the network, and do you see any limitations on the short or on the longer future in terms of managing the increasing amount of data that new experiences uh, uh, generate? For us, um, we, are, we are actually limited to 100 bytes, because we're, the way we're able to actually, because we process at the edge, is why LoRa is perfect for us. Um, we, we, we don't need to process more data than that. Um, it does enable us to have 300, 400 devices, for example, on a site, just connecting to one gateway um, and transfer all that data across. Um, and it's very efficient. What, what, the, what we might be wanting to do and what we're looking to do is to extend the range further to make so we get a greater distance but for us right now, we don't need to. We don't need more. Don't need to take more data because of the because of the nature of what we're measuring. Um, some of the, the others may have something else to say. Yeah. Of course, so LoRa is not is not designed to transport a video uh, this type of information. Of course, by definition. But there are some strategies. First of all, because regarding it's having a more a very important level of information and the way you transmit it, if it you need real time, near real time. First of all, you can compress your data. And, you, and so it's quite efficient uh, in terms of compressions and send it from time to time. Uh, you can even cut your messages if you really need to have complex protocols. Most of the sensors positioning is quite simple. Temperature and openness of the, the, the tab is quite simple. The vibration pattern I miss, so gets into the hundred bytes. Same for I get for the noise, uh, I won't have the details. But most of the time, the, the, the size of the, the payload is enough to cover more, but it can be cut, it can be compressed. There are a lot of strategy mm -hmm. to, to serve more complex uh, use cases uh, by application and design. Okay. I don't know if someone uh, to add. I, maybe I can complete the answer. The, you're very right. We're limiting in size of message and by the bandwidth, but we have implemented in LoRa Alliance, that's the standardization part I was explaining at the beginning, some compression mechanism that will concatenate, by, by concatenate sorry, uh, longer message, so that will enable new use cases, still with some limitations, so no video, we don't do all of IoT, but with concatenation, for instance, it's very well suited for electricity meter, where they will send a log of information, and we can manage that now through concatenation. Yeah, I, I think the most important is that 
the, the, a, a, any type of use case can be accommodated, provided that the amount of information that you have to send is reasonable. If you need to analyze every second of a video, you don't use LoRa for sure. Yeah, yeah. But just for your information, I mean, we are doing FOTA, so in, in devices that are in volume. So we can even organize, you know, the, the, this firmware update over the devices over a very low data rate uh, technology. So the protocol that has been developed uh, in the LoRa Alliance is actually very rich today in all these necessary uh, tools. And we're speaking about compression. We speak about organizing the firmware update over the air, etc. The protocol now has all these necessary tools to uh, accommodate any kind of use case, provided the information that you have to send is not too uh, big. OK, maybe one last question. Yeah, I have one question for Adrian. Uh, so, so you mentioned uh, mission critical uh, project. Um, like downtown of equipment, etc. Do you think that LoRaWAN is the best technology for that? And do you have SLAs that you can achieve with LoRaWAN? So f for us, it's it's definitely the best for what, what we need to go and do um, because of because of the the three things um, which I talked about. But the first is the security aspect that LoRaWAN gives you. The second is because of the distance that we're able to go and cover. And the third is because of its its low power consumption. You know, we want to make sure that when these guys are stuck onto a bit of equipment in a hostile environment, that an engineer really doesn't have to go back to that place in an unplanned way. We want it so that the so that the maintenance crew know that they've got a problem that's coming up and are able to go to it in a in a safe way. Um, in a, and in a less frequent way. As far as SLAs are concerned, um, we it's we don't have SLAs ourselves because we are giving best advice on a predictive basis, not on an assured basis. We're saying it is likely that you have got a problem on this piece of equipment. You know, 85 percent, 90 percent certain that you have a lubrication leak or or you have a problem with your bearings. And it's then down to the engineers to actually go and look and see what that particular piece of equipment is doing in that specific environment. Because it varies a lot. You know, it, the, you can have the same pump, identical pump, sitting in one environment and have it running the same pump running a different environment, and they'll behave completely differently just because of the way perhaps they've been installed and been mounted and the product that might be passing through them. Um, and from that point of view, it's down to to the uh, the operators themselves to determine how they integrate this into their own overall maintenance strategy that they've got. Okay, so I think we'll have to conclude. Uh, do we, uh, Megan? Yeah, we pass. Ah, sorry. So first, maybe come any time to the booth there, 20 meters from here, G05. Okay. Uh, last message. If you've been able to come here, you could come in a few months, end of March, same place, Palais des Congrès, here in Paris. Laura Alliance will celebrate its six-year anniversary. We planned that for five years, but couldn't do it for obvious reasons. But it's still planned, end of March. Here, we expect 2,000 people, so same format. You'll have a, a demo, exhibitions, plus a big conference. So look, you can scan, you can get it. And don't leave the room without your uh, Laura One notebook. So we bought some Moleskin painted in yellow, put the sticker. So please take one for two reasons. It's nice, and we don't want to carry them back to US. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>